Hereby I open this academic ceremony at Maastricht University. My name is Ton de Goei. I will be the pro-rector and the chair of the uh, degree committee. And first of all, I would like to welcome Mrs. Wu Uyen Chao Nguyen. And she will defend her thesis in public. And the thesis is entitled Multimodality Imaging in Cardi Cardiac Resynchronization Therapy in Silico and in Vivo Analyses. Um, this um, thesis will be uh, defended for a double doctorate degree of both the Università della Svizzera Italiana in Lugano, Switzerland, and Maastricht University. Uh, welcome to all members of this degree committee, uh, in particular the four supervisors sitting opposite to me. Um, Anna, you will see Professor Prinsen. He is Professor of Electromechanics of the Heart of Maastricht University. Professor Auricio, he is a Professor of Cardiology of the, at the Instituto Cardio Centro Ticino at the Università della Svizzera Italiana Lugano, Switzerland. Professor Kevin van Noy, he is a Professor of Electromanagement of Heart Failure at Maastricht University Medical Center. And Professor Krause, he is Professor of Advanced Scientific Computing, also at the Università della Svizzera Italiana at the Faculty of Informatics in Switzerland. Um, I will introduce the, seven, the six opponents later during uh, the ceremony, and I would like to welcome all those who are present here in the aula, and I welcome also, also the um, followers of the live stream. Um, Mrs. Nguyen, may I invite you to give a summary of your thesis, and I wish you lots of success in the coming hour. The floor is yours. Thank you. Dear Pro-Rector and Defense Committee, uh, dear friends and family, in the next 50 minutes I will present an overview of the work performed in my thesis entitled Multimodality Imaging in CRT, Cardiac Resynchronization Therapy. The heart is an essential organ that maintains the blood circulation, ensuring the supply of oxygen-rich blood to our tissue. The mechanical pump function of the heart is initiated by an electrical conduction system that simultaneously propagates through a left bundle and a right bundle, leading to a synchronous contraction of the heart, heart chambers. Disruption in either of these electrical bundles can lead to a desynchronous electrical propagation, and this desynchronous electrical propagation can impair pump function and can ultimately lead to heart failure, which is a serious condition associated with symptoms of shortness of breath, fatigue, hospitalizations, and ultimately death. Cardiac resequenization therapy is a guideline recommended therapy that can cure this type of heart failure by, as the name implies, uh, resynchronizing the heart by simultaneously pacing of the heart chambers. CRT uh, reduces symptoms and improves survival on the long term. However, the outcome to cardiac resynchronization therapy can uh, varies widely, ranging from total recovery to a normal heart and to only modest or no improvement at all. This thesis therefore aims to enhance the efficacy of uh, CRT by improving patient selection with ECG and variants of the ECG and by optimizing device implantation with an image-guided strategy. <laughs> To identify patients who benefit the most from cardiac resynchronization th therapy, it is crucial to uh, identify the underlying electrical fingerprint. There are various, various methods to characterize this electrical fingerprint, uh, ranging from the well-known ECG, which involves the placement of nine electrodes on the chest, uh, to contact mapping, which is an invasive technique that involves the placement of catheters in the heart. ECG imaging is a more intermediate approach that involves uh, approximately 200 chest electrodes, a CT scan, and a mathematical model that can reconstruct the electro electrical activity on the heart without really going inside the heart. According to the current guidelines, patients are considered eligible for cardiac resynchronization therapy if they exhibit symptoms of heart failure, 
have an impaired pump function of the heart and demonstrate electrical dyssynchrony on the ECG. Electrical dyssynchrony on the ECG is characterized by uh, a prolonged uh, cure restoration and, um, and other factors on ECG. In a joint Lugano Maastricht project, we examined the impact of the heart torso geometry on the ECG by constructing five computer models of the heart um, tailored on patients who were referred for CRT. The diversity of the heart torso geometries among these different patients is evident in this slide. In these computer models, we varied the heart torso geometry by shifting and rotating the heart within the torso and by adjusting uh, the placement of ECG electrodes on the chest, which is a modification or a source of variation that's only feasible in a simulation study. In the following model, you can appreciate how the notch in this ECG disappears when we displace the electrodes downwards on the chest. The principal finding of this study was that we found variations in, that variations in the position of the heart in relation to the chest could impact the ECG and subsequently whether a patient is considered eligible for CRT. When oxygen supply to the heart is reduced, as in the case of a heart attack or myocardial infarction, the muscle tissue in the heart is replaced by scar tissue. Scar tissue is linked to unfavorable outcomes uh, and unfavorable outcomes to uh, CRT, given that pacing in scar is less effective. In a collaborative London Maastricht project, we explored the association between a 3D ECG and myocardial scar in 33 recipients of CRT. A three-dimensional ECG is an ECG in three orthogonal leads, X, Y, and Z, which can be reconstructed from signals from the standard ECG with a mathematical model. QRS area uh, on the right figure is a quantitative marker that we can derive from this 3D ECG. Scar tissue in the heart was assessed uh, with the gold standard MRI. And in this figure, um, look at the purple arrow, uh, bright indicates the presence of myocardial scar. The principal findings of this study was that the QRS area from the 3D ECG was negatively associated with a scar in the heart, and patients with the most favorable outcome to, to CRT had a low scar burden and a high QRS area from the three-dimensional ECG. In current clinical practice, voltage amplitudes are employed to delineate scar for the invasive treatment of cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, where low voltage are considered scar and high voltage are considered as viable or healthy tissue. Um, these approaches are mainly based on experimental animal studies, but limited validation in patients was available till date. In a collaborative Lugano Maastricht project, uh, we investigated the association between these voltages in the heart uh, with scar. And um, this circle, the green circle, is a two-dimensional representation of the left heart chamber. And I'll try to explain it a bit more in detail. The outer ring of the circle represents the basal segments of the heart, and the inner ring in the circle represents the apex, or the top of the heart. White uh, reflects normal healthy tissue in the heart, while green indicates scar tissue. So the darker the green is, the more scar tissue you have. I would like to note that uh, the color-coded dots uh, on the circle represents the voltages that you measure directly on the heart. And in this patient with regions of almost 100% scar, we still observed high voltages. And the use of voltage cutoff values to differentiate scar from normal healthy tissue was effective in only about 30 to 50% of the patients, reaffirming the poor association between voltages and scar. To better understand this poor association between the local voltages in the heart and SCAR, we conducted a sequential Lugano Maastricht project to explore uh, other factors that might influence voltages. We found that pacing in the heart could uh, induce an up to 40% change in the local voltages that we measure. And we also found that uh, when you have an electrical conduction defect in the heart, even in the absence of scar, you could already, uh, patients already demonstrated low voltages in a certain area. 
So in the first part of the thesis, our focus was on understanding uh, the ECG in the context of patient selection for cardiac resynchronization therapy. And in the second part of the thesis, we tried to improve uh, CRT implantation with the use, uh, with the implementation of multimodal imaging techniques. So during conventional CRT implantation, the pacemaker electrode is placed in the left heart chamber. Uh, and the left heart chamber electrode is positioned in arbitrary vein on the heart. We aim to tailor the electrode placement by creating a roadmap to guide an electrode to a vein remote from scar in the site of late electrical activation. As you can imagine that when you pace a site that's really late electrical activated, you may induce more electrical synchrony and uh, subsequently may induce an yeah, a better pump function of the heart. In a feasibility study of 18 patients, an MRI scan was made prior to implantation and we measured the electrical activity directly in the heart by putting catheters in the heart. We measured the electro electrical activity in these patients in the veins. In this representative figure, uh, you can appreciate an activation map of the veins of a patient where blue indicates blue and purple indicates very late electrical activation. On the right, we fuse this uh, activation map with three-dimensional reconstruction of MRI um, and during the implantation, where green in this figure represents a scar tissue that we derived from MRI. In this case, uh, the pacemaker electrode was successfully positioned in a vein outside scar in a region of late electrical activation. Using this uh, yeah, defined uh, high-end roadmap approach, successful positioning of the pacemaker electrode was achieved in about two-thirds of the patients, while in one-third of the patients, a suboptimal pos sub position of the pacemaker electrode was unavoidable. After we developed a roadmap during CRT implantation, we aim to further refine uh, this uh, roadmap approach by creating a roadmap prior implantation, because this would give the implanting cardiologist more time to consider and discuss the implantation strategy. For this, we collaborated with the Department of Advanced Computing Science to apply, uh, to apply a technique called ECG imaging that reconstructs the electrical activity directly on the heart with, as I previously already explained, uh, data from about 200 electrodes on the chest and a CT scan and a mathematical model. Additionally, we collaborated with the Department of uh, Radiology uh, to, implement a, to develop and implement a CT protocol in clinical practice that was specifically designed for imaging of the veins of the heart. This is a representative three-dimensional roadmap in the newer approach from a patient with anatomy of the veins from CT in relation to scar from MRI. So scar again in this figure is represented in green. On the right, you can observe an electrical activation map that we derived from ECG imaging. So this is a completely non-invasive map where blue indicates late electrical activation and in this patient, also the electrode could be positioned in a vein, in a blue area, so in late electrical activation, uh, outside the scar. Quite similar as in a previous study, successful electrode positioning using this roadmap was achieved in about uh, three, uh, three quarter of the patients, while suboptimal position of the electrodes was unavoidable in the remaining quarter of patients. In summary, so our thesis aimed to enhance patients' benefit from cardiac resynchronization therapy by refining patient selection and by optimizing device implantation through a combination of computer modeling, advanced imaging techniques, and also clinical patient studies. We discovered that the position of the heart in relation to uh, the chest influences the ECG and subsequently uh, can impact the selection criteria for cardiac resynchronization therapy. We found an inverse uh, association between the presence of SCAR on the 3D ECG and, uh, and QRS area derived from the 3D ECG. And we also found that uh, patients who respond best to cardiac resynchronization therapy have low SCAR burden and a high QRS area. 
Moreover, unfortunately, we found that local voltages uh, in the heart only poorly delineate scar and are affected by other factors such as pacing and the presence of electrical conduction delay. To improve uh, CRT implantation procedure, we developed and implemented an invasive and uh, non-invasive three-dimensional roadmap that integrates uh, multiple imaging um, techniques with the measurements of local electrical activity of the heart. Using these roadmaps, uh, the left chamber pacemaker electrode could be positioned in the target region in about two-thirds of the patients. So in this presentation, I've tried to demonstrate the scientific uh, importance of the thesis, but as I'm working as an ordinary physician in daily life, I would like to share a quote with you that's more close to my heart, one said by a great Maastricht cardiologist. It's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your clear presentation. The opposition will be opened by uh, Professor Schotten. He is the chair of the thesis assessment committee and he is professor of physiology, in particular cardiac electrophysiology. Professor Schotten. Thank you very much, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, what a fantastic thesis, I must say. Um, I read it really with um, a lot of pleasure and um, it's really giving a lot of insights. Um, I, I particularly like uh, the combination of those different modalities, uh, imaging for anatomy, imaging for SCAR, combined with electrophysiological measurements. So congratulations to this fantastic achievement, very well done. I also find that this thesis is very well written. Uh, it's easy to read, very accessible for the reader. And that is also something we always very much appreciate. And the congratulations, of course, also go to our pacing powerhouse in Maastricht, Professor Prinsen, Professor Van Nooy, and I'm also very happy that our uh, colleagues from Lugano made it over to Maastricht today. Thank you very much for participating in this important academic celebration today, and also to you, of course, as a part of the promotion team, uh, congratulations to this achievement. And I also would like to congratulate your family uh, you can be very proud today. So for the discussion, uh, dear candidate, I would like to talk a little bit about the future. Because the field of pacing is undergoing uh, changes, significant changes right now. Uh, and then I talk about, of course, the uh, introduction of conduction system pacing. Uh, so transeptal pacing, uh, hispernal pacing, LBB pacing, LBB area pacing. And uh, this may have consequences also for the field of CRT. It's already a little bit farther down the road for bradycardic indication, but also in CRT there are very promising results in terms of restoration of mechanical function, in terms of restoration of uh, or re-achieving synchronization. That's also promising for arrhythmias. We are not so sure yet, I think. Um, and. Um, you, so, so my first question is very easy just to give you also the opportunity to warm up a little bit. How do you see that? Do you think that, let's say, in five years from now or maybe in ten years from now, mm -hmm. um, his, uh, or conduction system pacing in general will be more or less a standard for the indication CRT? Mm. Um, highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your kind words. and. Um, uh, from the con congrats that I've received. Um, conduction system pacing is, yeah, or pacing in general, I think it's a very uh, highly moving energetic field. A lot of uh, has been changed in the past five years. Also uh, the introduction of conduction system pacing, which seems new, but is actually very old yeah, because it was actually already uh, cited in the papers by Norula in the 70s. Uh, you already uh, tried to uh, conduct a uh, hispinal pacing in patients with uh, left bundle branch block. And um, uh, I think um, uh, conduction system pacing does not need to, is, is, uh, I see it as a form of, of resynchronization therapy. Um, and I think it uh, will, will give the patient more options for resynchronization therapy. And I think we can use these, uh, yeah, these road mapping techniques 
Uh, not specifically, uh, well, th these were conducted five years ago, so back then conduction system pacing was not really implemented in clinical practice yet, but I do think we can uh, still use this roadmap approach not per se to look at uh, the best optimal venous position of, uh, uh, for the left ventricular lead, but to um, determine prior implantation the best resynchronization strategy for the patient. All right. Okay, I understand. So then, you, so obviously this would have an impact on what you have been doing, and also it would have an impact on uh, what you are currently doing in the project that luckily has been funded by the Dutch Heart Foundation. Congratulations to that, by the way. And uh, this is on its way. And it's also part of your thesis, which I very much appreciate because it shows a little bit on how this, where this research is actually going. Mm -hmm. um, so you say that the roadmap approach can still be used. I, I agree. Um, obviously then for the identification of patients who still would, even when conduction system pacing has been, will be more widespread, still benefit from biventricular pacing. Yes. So um, what kind of patients are we then talking about? So what, what is the ideal patient for biventricular pacing? Mm -hmm. And what is the ideal patient for, uh, let's say, transeptal pacing mm. for the indication CRT? Yeah. So um, if you really look at the previous studies who really looked at heart outcomes, such as heart failure and mortality, you know that um, conduction system pacing has not really made it yet compared to uh, traditional biventricular pacing. So um, all the results uh, in the I-Class study, which was a retrospective study with, I think, 10 or 15 centers, uh, or an observational study, they seemed very promising, but I think um, till uh, to date, um, we don't have that level of evidence uh, with conduction system pacing yet that, that can really replace uh, traditional biventricular pacing. Um, but uh, I, there are a lot of combinations of conduction system pacing. So I think if you ask me, like, what kind of patients is suitable for what uh, for conduction system pacing, it's a bit difficult to say because you have. Um, Conduction system pacing with just uh, left bundle branch area pacing, which is two leads, so right ventricular, uh, uh, right ventricular ICD lead and uh, LVAP, LVAP lead. But you can also uh, combine uh, his bundle pacing with the left ventricular lead, so his bundle bias optimized uh, CRT and uh, or LVB with uh, left ventricular free lead, uh, uh, lot CRT. And I think if you just have a patient with um, a very uh, proximal uh, left bundle branch block uh, with um, not much underlying myocardial substrate, then uh, actually all those resynchronization approaches work pretty well. But mm -hmm. the most uh, physiological approach, if it's uh, possible, is his bundle pacing. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you have uh, patients with uh, more diffuse conduction system uh, diseases and with still an intact his Purkinje activation, um, then I do believe I believe more in uh, traditional uh, biventricular pacing or uh, lot CRT, so left bundle branch area pacing All optimized right. with LV lead. Okay, so there are mm -hmm. still a lot of research questions that are open. Maybe yes. you can implement some of this also in your current study. Yeah. And um, I'm very happy with the answers and give the word back to the prorector. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Schotte. The opposition will be continued by Professor Conte. He is Professor of Cardiology at the Università della Svizzera Italiana, and he is uh, affiliated with the Instituto Cardio Centro Ticino in Lugano. Professor Conte. And Professor Conte is not here, but he is present online. We see him on the screen. Thank you. So I would like to congratulate the candidate on the amazing work done during her uh, PhD program. It was really a great uh, research work. So my first question is on the QRS area. Um, so um, in, uh, in your uh, study, you acknowledge, uh, the candidate acknowledge that uh, the low rate of LBB patients could be uh, considered as a limitation. Instead, I would consider it 
it as a strength of her work because uh, due to the uncertainties related to, fi to find um, good predictors in non-LBBB patients. So my question is, uh, um, did the candidate perform the specific subanalysis in uh, patients with specific morphologies other than LBBB? Uh, thank you for your kind words, and um, um, I, I try to uh, verify your question. So your question is about uh, the chapter three, I think. Or yes. Oh, chapter three. Uh, uh, right. It, 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 it's on the correlation between the QRS area and the CRT air response rate. So did we perform any specific uh, sub-analysis on the correlation between the QRS area and uh, the CRT response in uh, different morphologies other than LBBB? I, I, I have to uh, get back to the chapter. But um, from the London uh, Maastricht uh, collaborative group, yeah, I, I think, yes. um, as, uh, as I remember um, uh, by heart, uh, it was a mixture between uh, non-LVBB and LVB patients. And um, because the group, it, it only consists of 33 CRT recipients. So the group was too small to do this sub analysis in LVB patients. But uh, yeah, I agree. Um, I, I can uh, see where you're going um, because um, the LBBB patients, they could really um, impact the correlation association, I think, between the curious area and the uh, outcome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So my second question is on the in silico analysis. So you have correctly pointed, pointed out the effect of heart position and orientation in uh, on QRS morphology. In this study, most of the included patients were males and uh, I suppose Caucasian. So my question is to what extent sex and racial factors can influence a patient specific uh, uh, geometry? So, um, if I understand your question correctly, um, you're asking to to what extent the geometry impacts the ECG? Uh, right, but if we have any insight on uh, some uh, more sex related, because you included just one uh, a female patient, so do you think that could be uh, interesting also in uh, specifically assessing uh, a sex related uh, category of patients with this uh, respect? Yeah, uh, highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your question. So your question is uh, whether uh, sex impacts the influence of the uh, geometrical factors induced on the ECG. Um, we uh, on CRT patient one, that was the only female uh, patient, and she was a good responder uh, to CRT. And uh, I think if you look at her torso um, uh, in, uh, in chapter three, uh, you see that she has a relatively um, yeah, small torso and a uh, big heart. And I think even though her curious duration was not very prolonged, it, um, she still had really electrical substrate for CAT. So in these um, uh, models uh, that, that we generated uh, with uh, Propach, we did not really take into sex intake into account. We just um, uh, incorporated the geometry, but we didn't take into other factors into account that uh, might be different uh, for sex. So we just treated uh, patient one, so the only female patient of these five patients, we just treated her as a, a little male, a little man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. that's the Thank honest you. answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. If I have time, I have a very last, more general question on uh, uh, improvement of patients, uh, uh, patient selection or refinement of patient selection. So in cardiac dyssynchrony and response to CRT in heart failure, what do you think uh, that is the current role of genetics in uh, all your studies and uh, the ones reported in the literature? Of course, there is a clear dis uh, distinction between non-ischemic cardiomyopathy 
and uh, uh, the uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy. So do you think that all patients undergoing a CRT uh, implantation also when we try to assess the scar pattern should undergo a genetic testing to see the specific gene variants that can affect also the pattern, the morphology, the extension of, of the myocardial scar? Okay, so if I understand your question correctly, um, um, you're asking me whether um, whether we should uh, perform genetic testing uh, for patients with new cardiomyopathy first prior CRT implantation. So yeah, I I, I really right. uh, yeah I agree I agree with uh, that approach, and I I also think if we um, diagnose new cardiomyopathy. Um, uh, particularly if it's a young, a relatively young patient, and I consider young, like under sixty, under seventy years old, it's, or under sixty years. That's for me. It's for a patient <laughs> that's considered young. Uh, I do think we really need to find the underlying etiologies, which also incorporates uh, um, um, ruling out ischemia uh, with uh, MRI and ruling out any other. Uh, genetic uh, diseases and um, if the patient is viable and is really uh, willing to also ruling out um, myocarditis etc with myocardial bio um, bio biopsies uh, and uh, but I have to admit that in my um, yeah little experience as a, a resident cardiology so far um, most most of the newly diagnosed cardio, cardiomyopathies are ischemic, and there is only a very very little portion that the, of patients that we observe who have like uh, a genetic uh, underlying genetic uh, disease or um, or um, myocarditis that we can really treat differently than than how we treat all other uh, heart failure patients. So with um, ARB, ARBs, uh, MRA. Uh, SGLT2. So, um, but I do, I do really agree with you that we really need to um, detect the underlying etiology and first try to treat the patient as good as possible, specifically to uh, to that underlying etiology. And then, uh, if the patient is still like um, uh, dyssynchronous and, and has still impaired pump function and symptoms. I do think uh, we should consider um, biventricular pacing or, CR or any form of conduction system pacing, resynchronization therapy, or biventricular pacing, uh, resynchronization therapy. Yeah. Many thanks for your uh, response. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Conte. Uh, the next opponent is uh, Professor Meine. Meine. He is Professor of Internal Medicine in Particular Cardiology at the University Medical Center in Utrecht of Utrecht University. Professor Meine. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidates, first of all, my congratulations uh, to you and, of course, also to the uh, uh, supervision uh, team. So it's, it's a teamwork and uh, it's, uh, this, this thesis did not only include high-rate articles published in relevant journals, but also is uh, very uh, interesting, well-written and uh, especially with a general discussion of about 50 pages. So I have enjoyed uh, to read this and also the future direction you have mentioned. So very nice. And uh, um, uh, you have shown that, that, that your group are the leading group in Europe about uh, cardiac resonation therapy. Uh, and undoubtedly, you get uh, the DECA uh, grant for the clinical scientists. I'm, and I'm uh, very jealous, uh, so I... <laughs> So uh, we are the second, uh, the, uh, second chair um, in Utrecht, and you are the first. So, uh, but uh, dear candidate, of course, my uh, question. So I want to go uh, with you in discussion about chapter uh, five, especially about uh, figure uh, two on page ninety-two uh, of your thesis, and uh, looking at the box plots of the interquartile range of the twenty-fifth uh, and seventy-fifth percentile. There's a huge overlap in unipolar. Voltage without SCAR and SCAR, especially with a non transmurality. Whereas endocardiomyopathy showed a trend of low amplitude and having SCAR, 
but epicardial mapping did not show this trend. And regarding to the ROC curves, detecting scar with epicardial mapping looks like flipping a coin. You conclude voltage mapping to identify scars should be done with caution. And when I look at this uh, figure, so I think uh, it's, it's not possible to detect scar with epicardial voltage mapping. Mm -hmm. Was you surprised about this result? Yeah, a uh, highly esteemed uh, opponent, uh, thank you for, uh, for your kind words. And um, uh, yeah, regarding your question, if I was surprised when seeing these results, yeah, I was uh, actually, I was really disappointed. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because uh, I was hoping for a positive association, yeah. it's more yeah. easy to publish. So this paper. <laughs> This paper was rejected multiple times yes, uh, yeah. before we got it published, but I'm still very proud on this paper because I think it was uh, executed um, very well, and, yeah. uh, and but the results were disappointing. Yeah, yeah. of course, but uh, yeah. so, so uh, half of the patients you included in this study were patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, and, yes. and uh, always the scar tissue is subendocardial, and not all patients uh, suffer from transmorality. Yes. So then epicardial, you get uh, a vital myocardium, but endocardial, yes. not. Uh, so you compare this with MRI scan, so it's a gold mm -hmm. standard uh, to detect uh, scar tissue. Yeah. Uh, you have also written a very interesting uh, letter to the editor in Chapter 7 uh, to my colleague uh, in uh, London, uh, Jonathan Bihar, uh, and he used the CT scan to detect scar. So what, what do you think about uh, CT scan uh, at single scan pref uh, before CRT implantation? Because some patients got a contraindication for uh, uh, MRI scan because mm -hmm. of atrial fibrillation, bradycardia, or uh, device in this. So, so, so what do you think about CT scan to use this instead of MRI scan? Um, well, I think t till date, uh, MRI, I, see, I, see, I still uh, see MRI as the gold standard and um, I think it would be very useful for clinical practice if we could also uh, detect a scar with CT as good as we can do it with MRI, but we need to validate it first because the, um, uh, to date they use either sort of strain derived uh, measures to the, yeah, to find scar on CT or, uh, or we use wall thinning uh, to find scar but there's now also uh, lately we um, there have been developments in photon counting CT and there is a delayed enhancement sequence I think for CT that can delineate scar but we haven't validated yet we want to uh, validate it but if it's possible with CT it would be perfect because then we can uh, combine it with uh, ECG imaging and we can get a roadmap uh, with only one, one scan for the patient, so it's more patient-friendly. Yeah. Very good. So, uh, uh, do I have a, uh, time for more questions? Mm -hmm. so, 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 we have to uh, validate the extra um, uh, cellular uh, volume CT uh, 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 scan, so, so, but, but there are ongoing trials, yeah? so I'm, yeah. and, and I think the next uh, PhD thesis will also include the CT scan in Maastricht, <laughs> yeah? because so you are faster than we, we in Utrecht, so with <laughs> publishing this uh, result. Um, I, uh, one uh, uh, question uh, about the chapter eight, uh, you have used the CT scan for the CT angiography to uh, look at the coronary sinus and the coronary veins. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you look at uh, uh, figure one on page 139 of chapter eight, uh, so you see uh, on the CT scan that in the mid-lateral left ventricular free wall, there is not any uh, coronary vein. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that when you see this on the CT scan before CRT implantation, uh, uh, you will, uh, is, it, is it possible in those patients to implant a, a, a CRT or do yeah. you want to switch directly to conduction system basing? for example. Yeah, the, you actually already gave the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think that, um, we, we already started that discussion uh, with um, how do you see conduction system pacing and how do you see, because this recent that in, in this thesis was conducted a few years ago, and I do think that uh, road mapping and uh, CT of the coronary veins is also part of the road map. If we mm. Uh, see suboptimal coronary veins, suboptimal coronary veins anatomy on the roadmap. We can already uh, decide prior implantation to uh, to aim for conduction system pacing yeah. resynchronization yeah. therapy, uh, especially if those patients don't have septal scar. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, but 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 on the fluoroscopy, you showed that there is a small collateral vein uh, mm -hmm. coming from the anterolateral branch to the posterior lateral branch. Perhaps mm -hmm. you can also use uh, additional techniques such as a snare technique yeah. uh, to put the left ventricular lead through this. But uh, once more, a uh, lot of con uh, congratulations from UTEC to Maastricht uh, uh, Lugano, and I'm satisfied, uh, very satisfied with your answer. Thank you, and give uh, the word back to the uh, prorector. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Meijer. Um, the opposition will be continued by uh, Professor Petsuto. Uh, he is Professor of Cardiac Electrophysiology Machine Learning at the University of Trento in Italy. Professor Petsuto. Thank you, Prorector, for, uh, for the word. And uh, dear candidate, congratulations also from my side for, uh, for this very nice work. I really much enjoyed uh, reading the, the thesis. In particular, what I found uh, very interesting is the interaction between the computational models and, and the clinical practice, clinical data, and uh, <clears throat> that's, that's very, uh, very important, of course. So my first question goes in this, in this direction. So we see that uh, there is an increasing, uh, um, let's say, invasiveness, some sense of, uh, of computational models into, into the clinical practice, or there is desire you know, to introduce these tools into the, into the clinical practice. Uh, according to your, let's say, experience over the last years, what are the current, uh, what is the current state of the heart in that sense, and what are the current impediments um, in order to, let's say, ease uh, these uh, these uh, synergy between the, the mm -hmm. two tools? Uh, highly esteemed uh, opponent, uh, thank you for reviewing the thesis and uh, for your uh, kind words. Um, yeah, there, I think there are a lot of. Um, uh, to date, there are a lot of methods to look at the electrical activity of the heart, and it really depends on uh, what your purpose is. Um, for instance, if you want to do optimization of uh, resynchronization therapy, I think you, you don't really need this ECG imaging. You might uh, uh, only need maybe body surface mapping, or uh, we now also have the ultra-high frequency ECG to mm -hmm. look at uh, synchrony. Or even more simple, just uh, the curious area that we derived from the uh, vector cardiography from the standard ECG. Uh, but if you want to uh, really incorporate the anatomical component of the heart, um, such as uh, road mapping prior implantation to really plan your pro implantation procedure, then um, I think uh, until now ECG imaging is maybe the best non-invasive approach. But um, I think um, where the future is heading to is uh, to, um, to also incorporate artificial intelligence or yeah, machine learning in these, um, uh, uh, with ECG imaging, or I'm more thinking about more of a forward model or, um, or an, um, uh, how do you say it? Yeah, um, incorporate artificial, artificial intelligence to like, uh, generate a sort, sort of an average uh, heart torso geometry, um, for instance, by uh, with mm -hmm. input of patient um, height or weight, uh, so that the patient does, need, does not need to undergo a CT scan, which is which causes a little bit of radiation. Uh, so um, yeah, there is an um, yeah we have of course um, your model, the Iconal Petsuto model, which I think is very promising in replacing uh, ECG imaging because it only requires uh, standard uh, recordings from the standard ECG, uh, and there's also a similar approach uh, that that we recently discovered, and it's a small company in Italy. But they don't really um, give price how they what the underlying technique is, but it's explained, and but it's also based on just using signals from the 12 lead ECG uh, to generate an, an activation map of the heart, and I think because we, we are somehow lucky that we work with patients with wide QRS because those patients, they have much more uh, easy to com comprehend activation patterns than, than patients with narrow QRS. And then for, the, for our patients, I think uh, iconal models or incorpora incorporation of artificial, artificial intelligence to make a more generic uh, anatomical model of the heart uh, is more suitable. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, many thanks. But uh, how do you see the? I mean, from a more practical point of view, the interaction as a clinician. Now that you you have data, you will you upload this data somewhere on a system or a computer program? Click a button and get out. This is going to be a one way. So yeah. I have all data, 
yeah. and I get the output because maybe there is a company providing for a service yeah. for doing that, yeah. or it's more like a, that you as a clinician are really mm -hmm. using a, a tool in, in your, in your yeah. practice in, in that sense, in the so very vision. So uh, more as a, how do, do I um, practical, practically implement this in daily clinical practice? For instance, yeah, yes. Yeah. To be very, very honest, I think um, these um, electroanatomic non-invasive mapping uh, for the next five years is only uh, will only be done in academic centers mm -hmm. or really uh, highly specialized centers because I'm currently working as part of my training in a more peripheral center and there's on, there's li little time to do all these advanced <laughs> uh, imaging in, in this patient. So um, I think uh, ECG imaging or any form of non-invasive mapping uh, should, it, uh, is only reserved for uh, academic research or really highly specialized centers such as Maastricht eh, or, or uh, Lugano. Um, but um, maybe in the future, if, it, if we have like a dedicated and easy software system um, that goes along with it, because now we really need a PhD student uh, to do all the work, uh, as I did. Um, <laughs> but maybe if we have like a very easy to use system, if we make it more easy for clinicians to use it, uh, like instant uh, activation map, mm -hmm. then it might have a chance for widespread clinical use in also the small peripheral centers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, if I have a very quick, uh, very quick uh, uh, question is, do, do you also see a problem in terms of uh, robustness and validation of, of these methods uh, in terms of uh, uh, Let's say applicability, no, also for a CGI, not, not mm -hmm. so something more intermediate, not yeah. this uh, very novel. Yeah, that's novel a very project. good point because um, uh, not very long time ago, um, the Bordeaux group, or um, I'm trying to remember, Laura Jocelyn Duchateau, mm -hmm. he published a paper in Heart Rhythm about the validation of ECG imaging. Uh, with, and he validated it with contact mapping, and it was very disappointing. Yeah. So the association. Uh, between uh, ECG imaging and contact mapping was um, not very good. Um, but he also, um, if you read the paper very well, he also uh, <laughs> said that it does work for uh, paced rhythms and patients with white QRS complexes. So that's why I said we're lucky to work with uh, in the field of biventricular or in the field of resynchronization because all our patients have a wide QRS. Yeah. So we still have a lot of work to do yeah. research. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pezzuto. Uh, the next opponent is uh, Professor Perantini. Uh, he is also not here, but he is present online. He is Professor of Cardiology, and he is also uh, affiliated with the Università della Svizzera Italiana, and at the Instituto Cardio Centro Ticino in Lugano. Professor Peracini. Thank you very much, uh, Prorector, and uh, thank you very much uh, for the nice presentation. I also would like to congratulate the candidate uh, for the excellent uh, work. Uh, I am uh, an interventional cardiologist, and I can say that uh, uh, your uh, thesis was really also accessible for non-electrophysiologists. A very well written uh, work. Congratulations again. Uh, just as some uh, uh, general uh, uh, question. In uh, your summary, you stated uh, that uh, we conclude that the future of image uh, guided uh, LD, LD elite placement may be integration of multiple modalities, uh, combining the strengths uh, of multiple uh, techniques. Uh, I can only support uh, your message. Uh, and my question is, can you imagine to create an algorithm uh, to be implemented in the guidelines uh, just uh, to define how to proceed uh, when you have just uh, the critical cases where you can predict a suboptimal result? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for um... Uh, reviewing my thesis and uh, for the congratulations. Um, so your question is whether we can develop or, uh, an algorithm in the guidelines um, that um, right. 
that predicts the outcome to uh, to resynchronization therapy. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. I. I do. <laughs> I, I think that 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 would be the future yeah, to um, to make a cer such um, yeah I think I think we all try to uh, identify all these uh, factors that might predict outcome to uh, cardiac synchronization therapy to really make a sp patient specific uh, prediction uh, model uh, of the patient and uh, I think. Uh, one step ahead of that, uh, of your thought, is that we, um, yeah, incorporate all these uh, data from the clinical patients, such as uh, demographic factors, but also like imaging, uh, um, imaging echocardiography, uh, ECG, and that we can, so that we can um, generate a more, yeah, digital twin of the patient, uh, and where we can really uh, virtually test the optimal treatment. So I think, yes, of course, we, we want to make a, a prediction uh, model to see uh, which patients benefit the best to what, what type of resynchronization therapy. And we also want to generate a sort of virtual patient to, to, test, <laughs> to test the optimal uh, treatment in that patient. I think that's the future, yeah. But we're, yeah, it will take a few more years before we get there. Thank you very much uh, for the clear answer. Uh, one more uh, question concerning uh, uh, so the daily clinical activity. If uh, we consider just a young uh, doctor or a clinician uh, uh, dealing uh, with a heart failure patient and the possible candidate for resynchronization what should one pay attention to just according to your conclusion to your global message uh, what should we consider to implement immediately what we have to pay attention to starting from the ecg and the mri and ct and uh, all the which uh, can be the message to the imager, to the radiologist or to the cardiologist performing uh, the MRI. What should he pay attention to in terms of uh, better prediction of, uh, of CRT treatment? Um, yeah, so um, for what I understand your question is what kind of, which kind of data is the most important for prediction to outcome to CRT? Yes. Um, I think uh, we start with the ECG. And I think if it's a very, um, yeah, in my, in my thesis, I investigated all kind of methods to assess dyssynchrony, but I still am really um, fond of just the classical ECG. And if it's a really classical left bundle branch block, I think, uh, or like the Strauss left bundle branch block, uh, then uh, I think yeah, you, you're pretty much, you don't really need all these high-end techniques. So that's the first thing. I think we need an ECG and an MRI first, uh, because I think a scar is, uh, scar is the most important and the underlying electrical substrate of the patient is really important. Uh, but if you really doubt about the underlying uh, substrate on the ECG, then I would aim for uh, more advanced uh, electrical uh, techniques such as um, the vector cardiography, um, which is not really advanced, but it's still um, it takes a little bit more effort than the standard ECG, and uh, and uh, other techniques as non-invasive mapping. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. One uh, last uh, and a quick uh, question concerning the electroanatomical. Uh, mapping which is not performed routinely is a more a research tool to predict what are your recommendation just a, your uh, opinion in term of uh, is a useful tool should we consider to implement in uh, as you mentioned peripheral center or is it still a, a tool more for a dedicated center center performing research activity I think uh, electron. You, you may give a short answer, please. Okay, yeah. Uh, 
I think it's more reserved for um, uh, specialized centers. And I think it's only for those patients where we don't really understand the ECG completely yet. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just let me say, as a dean of the biomedical faculty in Lugano, we are very proud just to promote the dual degree. And I would like really to thank the expert groups, Professor Prince and Professor Auricchio, Professor Vernoy, Professor Krause, we are just, uh, let me say, very proud of uh, what you are doing in terms of research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pedratini. The sixth and last opponent is uh, Professor Lumens. Uh, Professor Lumens is uh, Professor of Computational Cardiology at Maastricht University. Professor Lumens. Thank you, dear Prorector. Dear candidate, um, may I kindly ask you to one of your paranymphs to read Proposition 8. Uh, proposition 8, an individual can achieve excellence either as a clinician, excel as an engineer, or master the dynamic interaction between both domains. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would like to respond to that. I just wanted to hear that read out in the open because I can't agree more. Uh, you know that, and um, I'd like to complete this proposition because I think there is a fourth option, and that is someone, that's you, reflecting someone who, who actually does all three because you're a clinician, you're a good engineer, and you build bridges. You form bridges, and that I wanted just to say, and that's a huge compliment. I really, really am proud that you're in, in our Maastricht uh, environment, and we would like to keep you there, of course. Um, I think your academic skills and training and, and also the, the immense quality and impact of your work also reflects the solid fundament you've been building on um, uh, by your family, of course. Congratulations. And the STAR team uh, on the other side. Uh, that also reflects the multidisciplinary teamwork that you've done. So um, my uh, huge and, and sincere compliments with that. Um, now, the other paranymph may have been relieved, but uh, I have bad news um, <laughs> because I also want um, Proposition 5 to be read, please. The septum's behavior during left bundle branch block remains a mystery. Thank you. Can you... Dear candidate, can you explain yourself with this? What, what brought you to this mysterious proposition? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for this uh, very nice compliment. <laughs> um, yeah, why is the septum a mystery? I've been uh, really looking into the septum because um, I don't really remember the chapter, but in, this, in, the, in the wavefront study where we looked at the voltage amplitudes in patients with just a pure uh, left bundle branch block with no underlying electrical uh, fibrosis, uh, not on, no underlying um, myocardial scar, we found these local low voltages in the septum. Yeah. And it was yeah. very consequently present uh, in, in all LBB patients. Uh, so I really tried to uh, investigate what could be the reason for these low voltage septums and um, I looked at the activation time, but there was no association between low voltages and activation time. I, um, I wanted to conduct a conduction velocity in the septum, but I mm -hmm. couldn't really figure it out yet. And we also, although it's not in this thesis, we also looked at the septal breakthrough. And there was like a um, U-shaped association between the septal breakthrough area and the transeptal time. Um, so, I, we, for those pure electrical left bundle branch block, you, they have an average transeptal time of 30 milliseconds. And uh, if they have a shorter transeptal time or a higher transeptal time, they have a higher breakthrough area. So, it's, yeah, it was, I, we have never published it because it, I don't really know how to interpret it. But, yeah, there are a lot of things about the septum that, that's still a mystery that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. I think one of the possible reasons for this is that there must be some anisotropic uh, conduct, um, conduction, maybe 
because of the direction of the fibers in the septum. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's different. Um, but yeah, it's something I would really still want to investigate. Yeah. Yeah. So so <laughs> you're 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 still seeking in in the more electrical range. Maybe there is some mechanics that interacts with the electrics. I don't know. Huh? But do you do you? see an option there or is that too early to say something about that there there is something uh, quite interesting because i've read just one paper uh, who looked at uh, strain uh, patterns uh, in lbbb patients mm -hmm. and um, yeah of course we know um, your systolic stretch index i really appreciate that um, but um, they in this paper it was from the amsterdam group they looked at uh, strain a local strain, and mm -hmm. they found that septal strain was really um, uh, was really a good predictor for CRT outcome mm -hmm. in in these LVB patients. So yeah. yeah, so it's also the peak deformation that is yes, lower, the voltage that is yeah. lower. So yes. yeah, we cannot exclude that the one has to yes. do with the other. Yes. Um, then moving onward with mecha mechanical electrical, you you really nicely debate. The, the lead targeting mm -hmm. in your general discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know there has been said a lot about this and, uh, and you nicely give an overview of that, but you also pose, and that, that I find very interesting on page 231, this preliminary mm -hmm. study you say, you don't, you don't have to, to look it up because it's just written text. I'll, I'll read it for you. And, um, you, sh you say that there is a poor correlation between local depolarization time with ECGI mm -hmm. and time to peak strain. Mm -hmm. huh? um, and then you, you, um, you, you used time to peak strain as a reflection of mechanical activation. Mm -hmm. And can you reflect on that? How, how good of a, of a reflection is that of mechanical activation, you yeah. think? I think there there might be better measures to look at uh, mechanical activation. Uh, you can also um, um, look at the, the maximum peak, I think, and it's also sometimes difficult because what if you have two peaks and the strain patterns yeah. in, in yeah. these synchronous hearts are quite uh, complex. Mm -hmm. um, so we always choose the highest peak, but it's uh, something we did because we didn't know better. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. but the time to peak strain mm. in the late activated region. Wh when does it happen in the cardiac cycle, more or less? Uh, when does it happen? I don't. Oh, I'm S. Yes, Mr. Nguyen, you have noticed that the time for defending your thesis has passed. <laughs> the committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and in particular the quality of your defense. And I request you to remain here until we have uh, completed our deliberations and come back here. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will vote the candidate's performance behind the closed door. This process usually takes about 10 minutes.
your mind Years can't fly by now Don't waste all your time Cause I'll go, I'll go, I'll go the extra mile I'm a lace is tied. Long road, I don't waste no time. Break rules because faith decides. With the team and we chase the light. I make a move, fall down, shake it off. I hate to lose that branch, break it off. No room for negativity, praise and love. Prepare for deep part because we're taking off.
said sorry. You can use the power. I can
Mrs. Wu Uyen Chao Nguyen. Difficult. Um, the Drugi Committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And in view of this positive verdict, and taking into account, of course, your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. And Professor Prince is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom and law, and also Italian custom and law. And I invite now your supervisor to take the floor, Professor Prince. First, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Promise. You promise. Great. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here pre present, I hereby confer upon you, Fu Yuan Chao Nguyen, the degree of a doctor and grant you all the rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the University of Maastricht. And following that, Dr. Auriclio will give you a preliminary diploma from Lugano. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to hand to you a second degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Biomedical Sciences issued by Università della Svizzera Italiana, specialization in computational medicine for your outstanding work. On behalf of Dean of the Faculty, Professor Pedrazzini. Dr. Uyen, dear Uyen, finally it happened. It's done. Okay. You find it a bit difficult because you wanted to continue with your work, but this has happened now. You finalized your PhD thesis and defended it in a marvelous way. Really exceptionally happy with how you performed just a couple of minutes ago. You earned a double PhD degree from Maastricht and from uh, Lugano, as you say. In your thesis, uh, and so actually this is also the time that I really like to uh, thank my colleagues from Lugano, Professor Auricchio, Professor Kraus, and all the other colleagues uh, from Lugano about uh, our collaboration because uh, it was all possible because of that collaboration. On the other hand, and I will come back to that, you were able to play with us in order to achieve your goals. Uh, so it was a very nice collaboration altogether. In your thesis, you cover both fields where you have been received a master's degree, technical medicine from Twente and medicine in Maastricht. In Maastricht, you studied the master medical doctor and clinical scientist, of which our pro-rector was the director initially. Uh, but more specialist that most... I ah, there you go, finally. <laughs> Good. So... More especially is that most ideas for publications and chapters in the thesis came from you rather than from us. And all of the dozen chapters in your uh, thesis, you are the first author. So while a PhD degree is supposed to show that one is ready to become an independent researcher, you are already one. And this is also proven by the grant of the Dutch Heart Foundation that you received almost two years ago. Again, an idea from you. And I wondered whether it would be wise to apply for that already because you were busy, you were just ready to give birth to somebody, 
Uh, and I think you wrote the grant between Christmas and New Year, right after that birth. I mean, how do you want to do that? And, and your first version was just so good that Kevin and I had no real comments about it. And note, audience, that it is highly unusual that such grants are given to people without a PhD degree. So very special. And you managed, and you managed also because you are exceptionally good in presenting your work to others. And it even has been noted by the Rector Magnificus of our university for whom you gave a presentation. She is an expert in legal issues around war victims, so really a lay person, and she still remembers your presentation. Um, and so really, you really know very well what you do. And you also give him the book. <laughs> so he can start reading. <laughs> oh, pen, also. <laughs> you also managed to arrange complicated clinical studies. You involved CT and MRI, radiologists, cardiologists, ECG imaging engineers, and of course, cardiologists and physiologists. As Joost said a few minutes ago, you really build bridges yourself, and that's really appreciated. You also made contact to several external research groups, like London, Bordeaux, and uh, in Czechia, uh, Brno, and Prague. And actually, you introduced me to the people in, in, in the Czech Republic who developed the uh, ultra-high frequency ECG, and the collaboration with them expanded to me and to Kevin, and it will last for many years. So thank you very much for that as well. Uh, and of course, you contributed importantly to the collaboration with Lugano, uh, where you worked also with computer scientists. I mean, the hardcore <laughs> computer scientists, I would say. So really, you can collaborate uh, with everything and everybody. As you may know, uh, former heads of cardiology in this university had expressions for the quality of PhD students. And the best ones were called self-rising baking flour. Yeah. You add water, put it in room temperature, and it grows to a great dough. Well, you are next level. We need to put your flour in the fridge, otherwise it grows <laughs> out of the pan. New ideas keep on coming all the time. There's just a problem. You cannot establish all of them because there's so much that you want to do and the, the day has only 24 hours. Uh, and yet, I mean, you really perform beyond our expectations all the time. In executing the studies, you manage to get everyone around you to help you. And you do so in a very friendly way. You are not acting like a gorilla beating on your chest. <laughs> eh? In contrast, you're extremely polite, yet persistent, because you know what you want. And really, by this behavior, you, are, you can become a role model for many young investigators. Not only because you are a woman, not only because your skin has a color, but because this behavior that is the perfect example of what our society eh, needs now and in the future. And this is what everyone around you knows. Eh? And this is also why everyone around you, from current director, leaders in cardiology, university grant office, human resource department and others, really want to help you to allow you to develop the best possible career, and preferably in Maastricht. So for the future, I say, Uyen, keep on doing the good works. But one advice that has been given to you several times by several people. You are a perfectionist for all what comes in your way. Research, clinical care, family, and probably also friends. You can only continue to do so in the rest of your life, because life is a marathon, if you make choices, set priorities. Start with reserving sufficient quality time for yourself, for your family, and for the rest of the time, delegate as much as possible to others. Don't do it yourself. You have people now to do it for you. And that gives you the opportunity to reach the goals that you want. Say no to not so urgent or not so relevant invitations. 
So that's the advice. Again, Vian, congratulations with your PhD. And I also like really to congratulate your family with this achievement, parents, brothers, sisters, your husband, where is he gone? Uh, is his son? Okay. <laughs> there. Uh, and of course, also your two sons, uh, Benjamin and Thomas. Uyen, I wish you all the best for the rest of your life, and I hope to be able to follow the, that development for many more years to come. Well, thank you, <laughs> Professor Brinson. Thank you. Dear Uyen, I have the honor and the privilege to speak at your PhD thesis defense, an act which you easily mastered as many things in your scientific career. Congratulations for that. Congratulations as a first PhD student of a joint program between our university, Università della Svizzera Italiana, and Maastricht University. This is a landmark in the academic journey of these two European universities. I hope to see many more talented students, <coughs> as you are, who are willing to enter a similar PhD program. I have a challenging task to speak after Professor Prinsen. All of you know how he is an eloquent speaker, someone very hard to compete with. And my task now is to give you a laudatio after his laudatio. I could make my task easy and short, and I would do. Indeed, I echo all Fritz's remarkable statement, all. I echo his profound admiration for a young lady, for an incredibly talented colleague, for a young, passionate scientist, for a wonderful mother, we've seen this one, for an exceptional person, for you. Thank you very much for that. The time of PhD thesis is also um, always the best moment in my own life to reflect and to go back in my own professional career, teaching activities, to match the candidate today with past ones. I think it's a natural event that everyone in our daily life do. I have to confess that my entire career, I cannot find any of a student and colleague I coached, and you know, I have gray hairs, so I have many years so far who have been a charming personality, the same passion and persistence in science, the same creativity you show. Again, congratulations for that. This PhD thesis, is the perfect synthesis of who, who Uyen Chao Uyen is. A creative person. Have a look at the cover page of her thesis. A masterwork in itself, created by using the most advanced artificial intelligence art software available. Congratulations for that. A humble person. In your propositions and we have already heard that has been already considered accompanying your thesis. You quoted three major humble personality who changed our way of living and acting. First, Thomas Jefferson, who was the third president of the United States of America, also the draftman of the Declaration of Independence. A man long regarded as America most distinguished Apostle of Liberty. And I think this is really a way for you to move on. Steve Jobs, a man who has changed forever our social life and the way of sharing content. Again, someone who are you. You changed the way in which we are sharing and translating from basic computational modeling clinicians. And finally, Hein Wellens, one of the founding father of electrophysiology and of this university, I think. He was saying once, it is nice to be important, but it is more important to be nice. And you are a very nice person. 
and very important to us. A highly productive scientist, 24 original contribution, all of them, most of them, in peer-reviewed, high-ranked journal, you are first author, a thesis, which is a book in itself. And I am very glad that six months ago, you took our advice from Professor Prince and my fans say, stop writing chapters. It would be a non-manageable thesis. I mean, this is something that we want you to acknowledge, this one. And of course, of course, a well-funded research program, which is also very unique. And finally, last but not least, the mother of two lovely children who are now born by our ceremony, and we will end very quickly soon. I found all these impressive things, really impressive and unique. So in closing, dear Uyen, you have been gifted with a very unique topic. Please recognize it. Don't challenge it continuously, but more important, be more indulgent with yourself. <laughs> this is my personal advice. I can already envision the gratitude and happiness of many of your patients you will treat during your career because they will benefit from your talent, from your charming personality, and from humanity. Thank you very much, and all the best to you, to your family, to your friends. Thank you. Esteemed Dr. Nguyen, dear Uyen, uh, it's my great pleasure to congratulate you with your doctorate, and I do that also on behalf of Maastricht University. And I would like to share some impressions of the committee with you. Uh, we have seen a very clear summary of your thesis, and the thesis itself is excellent. It is excellent because it's very unique in its multidisciplinarity, in its different modalities, and also it has been clear that you have brought people together, people with various disciplines, people with various impressions, people with various skills, and you have shown that uh, you can do very good collaborative work, and you are a, really a builder of bridges between researchers and disciplines. We have seen an excellent defense, very good, reflective, to the point, and uh, you have sh very clearly shown that you have a very broad uh, view uh, on knowledge, on problems of science, and you have demonstrated quite a broad aspect of skills. So we are very satisfied with your thesis and with your defense. And I would like to congratulate your four supervisors with this result in terms of excellent publications, excellent thesis, and uh, a very excellent defense as well. So Professor Prince, uh, Professor Oricio, Professor von Neu, and Professor Krause, congratulations with this result. Um, and of course, I would like to uh, share my congratulations also with your family with your partner, with your parents, proud parents, I think, and with your proud family, brothers and sisters. And also, uh, I would like to include other members of the family, which are probably not here, but can view um, the, the live stream of this uh, ceremony. And I would like to congratulate also your collaborators with your, and your friends and uh, other colleagues that are probably present here, or see the, um, the live stream. Um, and of course, all present here in the Aula, congratulations. I'd like to thank all the members of the assessment committee as well as this degree committee. I would like to thank in particular all the, um, the professors and, and in people involved in, as well as, as supervisors, as well as in the assessment committee and have critically read the, the thesis. So thank you, uh, in particular all members, but in particular all the, uh, um, the, 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 the people that are the guests today of Maastricht University, in particular of the Università della uh, Svizzera Italiana. Um, 
I would like to um, uh, to ask you when we close this ceremony, we will uh, before we close the ceremony, we will make a picture of the committee together with the the two. Uh, and I see there's only one left opponent uh, on the screen. Um, and then we will make, uh, I would like then to ask the people in the aula to move after the closing of the ceremony to the rafter, where is there the reception. And I would like to ask the members of the close family on the first row to stay here, because we make a picture here and we make a picture in the hall. Um, Hereby, I close this academic ceremony.